Welcome to this week's edition of the Optimum Synergy Podcast with our friend and your host, Adam Huber. Join Adam as he takes you on a journey into the realm of detailing, business, and beyond. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Welcome back to the Optimum Synergy Podcast. I am your host, Adam Huber. Today is another solo podcast, but this is probably going to be one of the most value-driven podcasts you could listen to this year. Whew, that's a big, uh, that's a big goal. What are we talking about today? We're talking about E Myth Revisited the book. This book is essential for you to be able to run a small business, any any really any business it is the foundation of how you should be thinking about your business it is the foundation on how you should be running business this is one of the bibles for running business and the interesting thing about this book is you're going to you're going to read it and i don't know if you could possibly execute on it well enough in your first business What I mean by that is I I think you have to learn a lot of lessons in this book before you actually go and execute on them. And I think that is where having a mentor or somebody when you are very first starting your business or consultant, whatever, when you first start off, I think that's where this book really starts to shine on having someone who's more knowledgeable than you helping you in your business because those people have already gone through what you're going to go through and you have to figure out what it's worth to you to pay for that experience level and everything for them to help you through your business right now in the OptiCope family, the optimum family, we are working with one of our installers who has done very, 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 very well for himself in Canada. His name is Tim MacDonald. And he has decided to do a coaching program for our installers. Now, I have reached out to a handful of installers that met Tim's criteria that I felt would be able to take those lessons, really act on them, and just 10x their business uh, hugely. And... I've reached out to them and you know, you're going to get, you're kind of, you're always going to kind of run into this where, well, you know, that's a lot of money. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that. And the thing I asked them is what would you pay to fast track your business by three years, five years, something like that. If that person is where you want to be in the next year, two years, what is that worth to you? If your business could 10x because of someone's advice, what is that worth? Now, a lot of people just think that it's a joke. A lot of people think that it is not worth the time or the the money to do that. And it's only the people that go through it that look back and say, wow, that was absolutely worth the money. And I can tell you that this book at... I don't even know how much this costs. Uh, let, oh, right here. Okay. This is $21. This $21 book will teach you everything that you need to know about how you need to be thinking about business and how you need to build your business from the beginning. So we're going to get right into it here. I have lots of points in this book that I'm going to be going over. I'm going to be giving my thoughts on it, but kind of keep that little preamble in the back of your mind that, you know, what would you pay for this kind of device. The first thing that I have written in here is it's a doozy fact. And I'm going to give a little bit of a personal story on it when I get done with this. Businesses start and fail in the United States at an increasingly staggering rate. Every year, over a million people in this country start a business of some sort. Statistics tell us that by the end of the first year, at least 40% of them will be out of business. Within five years, more than 80% of them, 800,000 businesses will have failed. And the rest of the bad news is 
If you own a small business that has managed to survive for five years or more, don't breathe a sigh of relief. Because more than 80% of the small businesses that survive that first five years fail in the second five. That's some heavy, heavy stuff, people. That's heavy. Think about that for a second. That it is, if you own a business that has managed to last to five years, you're in the elite. So you're already operating a business, which most people would not be willing to operate a business in the first place. I've spoken on this on this about the podcast before. If you have decided to take that jump and go out on that ledge, you're already in the very small minority of people that would do that. Now, if you manage to make it to five years in business, you're in an even smaller minority. You are in a very select group of people. Now you take those five years, those people that managed to have a business for five years, and if you're at year 10, you're in an even smaller category of business or just people. You're, you're in a very small category. You're operating on a different level. The little personal story that I have attached to this. Some friends of mine, Lauren, Clint, and I went to a college and spoke at an entrepreneurial class. And the professor or had the students ask some questions. And one of this one of the questions that he posed to the students was, Why are you in this class? And one of the students said, To make a lot of money. To which Clint, Lauren, and I all had a pretty good chuckle. And then I said, uh, you mind if I take this one, Clint? He goes, nope, go ahead. And I was like, all right. So I looked at the kid and I said, do you want to make a lot of money? He's like, yeah, yeah, I do. Do you want to make a lot of money right now? Oh, yeah, I do. And I said, you think business is the way to do it? Yep, sure do. And I said, awesome. Uh, go sell drugs or go sell your body. One of the two. That's the only way you're going to make money fast. And right now. To which, you know, there was a collective gasp in the room. Understandably so. We're talking to college students. They would never expect a business owner to say that. But it's true. If you start a business, people have this weird fantasy of thinking that <laughs> because you are you own a business that you make a lot of money. And uh, that's just quite simply not true. Just not. Uh, now, you might make quite a bit of money down the road but that's only if you build your business correctly which is exactly what we're talking about here then uh i i threw a little stat at them which is basically mirroring what i just said in here that the 80 percent of the 80 percent that happened to make it through those five years now take into a consideration that most of those people most of the business owners that happen to make it past that point I don't want to say most, but a good, good, good percentage of them are alcoholics. They're divorced. They have a drug problem or some type of dependency issue. Does that sound like a, does that sound like a great, great lifestyle? Hey, you made it past five years, but you're divorced. Uh, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully you're okay with that. And that's something that people don't talk about. Yeah. Hey, you made it five years, but you're an alcoholic because of all the stress and all the pressure that you're under. So anyways, keep that in mind when you want to start a business that it's not all unicorns and rainbows, folks. It's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of disappointment on that road to glory. So fast forwarding through the book a little bit and guys, seriously, if you want to there's so much value in this book, you need to read it. Now, we're talking about the moment in time that you decide as a person that you're going to go out and do your own thing. They're, they're, everybody can point back to the time where they said, I've had it. I've had enough. I want to go out on my own and do my own thing. Whatever that moment was. But we all make an assumption. And, and in this book, he calls it the fatal assumption. The fatal assumption is, if you understand the technical work of a business, you understand a business that does that technical work. The reason it's fatal is that it just isn't true. The technical work of a business and a business that does the technical work are two totally different things. But the technician who starts a business fails to see this. 
as I'm reading this book, I sincerely cannot stop thinking about detailers. I mean, it, the the detailing industry is such a unique field in the first place. And you guys know that I love you. And the reason that I love you is because... is, And I'm sh- trying to show you love by trying to be honest with you guys that you're, most of your guys' thinking is completely backwards. 180%, 180 degrees backwards. And you need to think about this in a different way. You guys started a detailing business. By, by far the majority of you guys, I, I could probably literally count on one hand... The amount of detailers that have started a business to be a business. You guys started a detailing business because your back was up against the wall. There came a moment in time where you said, I've had it. I want to go out on my own and do my own thing. And then decided to start up a detailing business because you knew how to do the craft really, really well. But you don't know how to business well. Now, some of you have transitioned from being able to do the craft really well into being able to do business really well. But by far, the majority have not. And some of you, I see Benjamin McKinney is in here. I see, some of, I see some of you guys that are people that have been in the industry a while. You know exactly what I'm talking about. They're the guys that always con- um, are always in the groups talking about how they're grinding, hustling, 18-hour days, boom, what? And then six months later, guys, uh, I'm, I'm having a divorce. My wife is mad at me because... Uh, You know, all I do is work. How can I get her to see my end of it? Yada, yada, yada. Well, hustle, grind, hashtag, right? All the entrepreneur hashtags. We see it all the time. All right. Now, we're going over the different kinds of personalities in a business. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say a couple of these and some of you guys, like probably about 30% of you are going to be like, yeah, that's me. That's me. That's, that's me right there. No, it's not. I'm going to tell you who, who most of you are. The entrepreneur. The entrepreneur lives in the future, never in the past, rarely in the present. He's happiest when left free to construct images of what if and if when. In science, the entrepreneurial personality works in the most abstract and least pragmatic areas of uh, particle physics pure mathematics, and theoretical astronomy. In art, it thrives in the rarefied arena of the avant-garde. In business, the entrepreneur is the innovator, the grand strategist, the creator of new methods for penetrating or creating new markets, the world-bending giant like Sears, Roebuck, uh, Henry Ford, Tom Watson of IBM, and Ray Kroc of McDonald's. There is 25% of you right now listening to this that say, I'm the entrepreneur. No, you're not. You guys are out washing cars. That's not, that is not new work. You're not changing the meta. You're not changing the macro. An entrepreneur is somebody who dreams about changing the fundamental way that people think about something. Now, are entrepreneurs always successful? No, no. They're dreamers. Now, you might have aspirations and dreams of what you want to be, That is not an entrepreneur, according to this book. The entrepreneur is someone who seeks to change the macro and change the way that people fundamentally think about something. Let's take, well, let's just take um, Starbucks, for example. When Starbucks came along, the meta for a coffee coffee shop, if you owned a coffee shop in, I don't know, 60s, 70s, whenever it was that Starbucks came along, you went into a coffee shop, you got your freaking coffee, you left the freaking coffee shop. A coffee shop in, I can't remember exactly where Starbucks started, so I'm sorry, but I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that it was in um, Seattle or up in the northwest part of the United States. So apologies, I don't know the exact area. But somebody had the thought process of what if we created a community inside the coffee shop where someone could come in, have their coffee, read a book, do some business, have a meeting, whatever and then replicated it a bunch of times. That is an entrepreneurial mindset. Let's take McDonald's. And McDonald's is mentioned a lot in this book. So, and if you guys have not seen the Netflix movie or just the movie that is talking about Ray Kroc and McDonald's. It was Seattle. Okay, thanks, Matt. You guys need to watch that movie. When Ray Kroc invented mcdonald's and i'm gonna go ahead and say invented because he 
change the fundamental way that burgers were made for a particular customer. There was a system in place and you got your burger in like almost instantaneously upon ordering it. Before that point, it was just like if you were going to a restaurant right now. You sat down, you ordered your burger, you waited 20 minutes, and then you got your burger, boom, paid, whatever. And you probably paid more money than what Ray was charging for a burger because he had a process and a system in place. He changed the meta and the macro of the way that burgers were made. So to the 25% of you that are out there right now thinking that you're an entrepreneur, you're not. According to this book, the manager, the managerial personality is pragmatic. Without the manager, there would be no planning, there would be no order, there would be no predictability. The manager is the part of us that goes to Sears by stacking plastic boxes, takes them back to the garage, and systematically stores all the various size nuts, bolts, and screws in their own carefully identified drawer. He then hangs all the tools in impeccable order on the walls. Lawn tools on one wall, carpentry tools on another. And to be absolutely certain that order is not disturbed, paints a picture of each tool on the wall where it hangs. There's going to be another... There's going to be another part of this uh, group that are listening that think that they're the manager because they're a detailer and they're detail-oriented. They are... They have to have everything in order. This is... Think wider than that. Your entire life that you have to have that kind of order you think very systematically you crave order most of you most of the guys that are running detailing businesses the they detail very well they detail in in a somewhat orderly manner but they do not have their lives in in a controlled it's more like controlled chaos it is not in a controlled fashion Most of you guys, I'm going to go ahead and say 80% of the people listening to this podcast that are detailers, this is you. The technician is the doer. If you want it done right, do it yourself. Now, this is a long explanation, and there is a great reason behind it because, uh, (laughs) um, first of all, I I want to drive home the point that you guys are technicians, and not only that, but it goes through... And it really defines what each different personality is. So hold, just hold on for a little bit while I go through this explanation. The technician is the doer. If you want it done right, do it yourself is the technician's credo. The technician loves to tinker. Things are to be taken apart and put back together again. Things aren't supposed to be dreamed about. They're supposed to be done. If the entrepreneur lives in the future and the manager lives in the past, the technician lives in the present He loves the feel of things and the fact that things can get done. As long as the technician is working, he is happy, but only on one thing at a time. He knows that two things can't get done simultaneously. Only a fool would try. So he works steadily and is happiest when he is in control of the workflow. As a result, the technician mistrusts those who he works for because they are always trying to get more work done than is either possible or necessary. To the technician, thinking is unproductive unless it's thinking about the work that needs to be done. As a result, he is suspicious of lofty ideas or abstractions. Thinking isn't work. It gets in the way of work. The technician isn't interested in ideas. He's interested in how to do it. To the technician, all ideas need to be reduced to the methodology if they are to be of any value and with good reason. The technician knows that if it weren't for him, the world would be in more trouble than it already is. Nothing would get done, but lots of people would be thinking about it. Put another way, while the entrepreneur dreams, the manager frets, and the technician ruminates. The technician is a resolute individualist, standing his ground producing today's bread to eat at tonight's dinner. He is the backbone of every cultural tradition, but most importantly, of ours. If the technician didn't do it, it wouldn't get done. Everyone everyone gets in the technician's way. The entrepreneur is always throwing a monkey wrench into his day with the creation of yet another great new idea. On the other hand, the entrepreneur is always creating new and interesting work for the technician to do. Very important point right there. Thus establishing a potentially symbiotic relationship. Unfortunately, it rarely works out that way. Since most entrepreneurial ideas don't work in the real world, the technician's usual experience is one of frustration and annoyance at being interpreted 
in the cur- course of doing what needs to be done to try something new that probably doesn't need to be done at all. The manager is also a problem to the technician because he is determined to impose order on the technician's work to reduce him to a part of the system. But being a rugged individualist, the technician can't stand being treated that way. To the technician, the system is dehumanizing, cold, antiseptic, and impersonal. It violates his individuality. Work is what a person does. And to the degree that it's not, work becomes something foreign. To the manager, however... Work is a system of results in which the technician is but a component part. To the manager, then, the technician becomes a problem to be managed. To the technician, the manager becomes a meddler to be avoided. To both of them, the entrepreneur is the one who got them in trouble in the first place. Woo! Boy. Okay. So that was a lot of reading. But I wanted to go over that part because I think that... Again, a lot of you don't think that you're a technician in your business, but you actually are. And I wanted to read through that part because that's going over a really great explanation of what a technician is in a business. And to be honest with you guys, as as much as I try not to be, there are still times where I am a technician, even operating inside of Optimum. I try to think about the bigger picture. I try to come up with uh, rule sets and strategies and everything like that. But that doing stuff like this, where I'm doing a Facebook Live, we're in the moment, we're in the heat. This is this is kind of where like this is home for me. I I'm I'm in the present. I'm talking with you guys. I'm reading your comments and every Chris. I see exactly what you're saying, and thank you for pointing that out. This is where I operate best, and I try to work outside of that. I try to grow myself into being into equal parts entrepreneur and manager. But if I'm being honest with myself, most of my personality is made up of uh, being a technician in everything, marketing, all of that. But I do try to be better at the other things. All right. This next part. So it is that an entrepreneurial business without a manager to give it manager to give it order and without a technician to put to the work is doomed to suffer an early and problematic uh, and probably very dramatic death. And that a manager driven business without an entrepreneur or technician to play their absolutely critical roles will put things into little gray boxes over and over and over again, only to realize too late that there's no reason for the things or the boxes she put them into such a business will die very neatly. In that, in a technician-driven business, listen very closely, detailers. In a technician-driven business, without the entrepreneur to lead her and the manager to supervise her, the technician will work until she drops, only to wake up the next morning to go to work even harder, and the next, and the next, only to discover, long after it's too late, that while she was working, someone moved a freeway through the store. What was I just talking about a little bit ago? In our groups, there is this fundamental flawed thinking of hustle grind hashtag, entrepreneur hashtags, all of them, right? And actually, I'll go ahead and say that in the business world, kind of in general, it's it that thinking is there. Well, if I just outwork everyone else, I'll, I'll make it to the top. Well, when you get to the top, what does that top look like? What 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 do you physically look like when you get to the top? That's going to be a rough ride. Now, is there times in business where you do have to hustle and grind for those 18-hour days? Yep. It's going to happen. You have to do that kind of work in order to be successful. You can't just simply work 4 hours a day from the beginning to to have a successful business. I would I would love to meet the person that worked 4 hours a week and has a very successful business that doesn't need to be um someone is someone's calling me glad it's in the other room see that was foresight right there actually it's just because i forgot myself in the other room but anyways i'm I, i'm i'm going to keep hammering on that because if you guys are currently working 12 to 14 hours a day in your business that's fine but what are you doing to get out of that you have to be working towards getting out of that and if you don't know how to do it find someone to do that for you. 
Find that person that has more experience than you. Bring them into your business and say, listen, I know how to do the work really well. I don't know jack about making this to where I don't have to do this anymore. Help me out. Guys, it's going to cost you money. Like, people with that kind of experience don't just give it away for nothing. Pay the fee. Ooh, the fee. We're going to get to that a little bit later. All right. For you guys that have been watching the podcast for a while, you already know what the fee is. If you want to go ahead and pay the fee now, that would be great. Because there are multiple people that need to hear this, in my opinion. And it's not because, you know, I'm just on camera. But I believe there's a lot of people that need to hear this. All right. So now we're going to go through the different phases of business. And this is called the inf infancy phase or the technician phase. And... To every most of you guys listen to this podcast again again this is this should resonate home with you if it doesn't you're either operating a very successful business and i want to talk to you or number two you're just lying to yourself straight like you are just lying to yourself in the beginning nothing is too much for your business to ask as the technician you're accustomed to paying your dues so the hours devoted to the business during infancy are not spent grudgingly, but optimistically. There's work to be done, and that's what you're all about. After all, your middle name is work. Hashtag hustle, grind, entrepreneur hashtags. Besides, you think, this work is for me. I was built to do this. And so you work. 10, 12, 14 hours a day, 7 days a week. Nothing's too long, nothing's too hard, nothing's too hot, nothing is too cold. You are the man. Detail you invented detailing. It is built around you. All your thoughts, all your feelings. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm going to go back one sentence. Even when you're at home, you're at work. All your thoughts, all your feelings revolve around your new business. You can't get it out of your mind. You're consumed by it. Totally invested in doing whatever it is, ne whatever is necessary to keep it alive. But now you're doing not only the work you know how to do, but the work you don't know how to do as well. You're not only making it, but you're also buying it, selling it, and shipping it. During infancy, you're a master juggler, keeping all the balls in the air. It's easy to spot a business in infancy. The owner and the business are one and the same. I'm going to pause there for a second. Do people know your business without knowing you, the owner? Ooh. Could could an employee of yours show up, and the customer says, and the customer does not say, "Where's so and so?" I was I was waiting for so and so to detail my car. Guys, the reason why this hits home for me so hard is because I literally had this business. It would, I mean, the business was literally called Adam Huber's Detailing. Because I was unimaginative. Actually, there's a story behind that. But um, And if we move on to the back page. Interesting point right here. In infancy, you are the business. It's even named after you. Joe's Place, Tommy's Joint, Mary's Fine Foods. So the customer won't forget that you're the boss. It is yours. <laughs> Guys. This is most of you. This is most of you that are operating a business. Come on, let's be real. Let's not beat around the bush. Now, in the beginning, I, it, you know what? I'm going to make the argument that it's somewhat okay for that to happen. When I come across something new that I want to execute on, it consumes me. I literally find every possible thing that I can on it and learn more. Watch more think more i am that person i get it egos mm, there's a there's a pretty big ego in detailing um i don't think i don't know if so I'll, i'm gonna go chris asked a really great question i'm just gonna go ahead and start talking about it because i i think it's well it's absolutely relative to this point when i started adam huber's detailing the only reason why i called it adam huber's detailing was because my wife jessica worked as um, an auditor for the state well as an auditor for the state 
she was concerned that if I'm doing side work and getting money for it, that I need to have a registered business. So me, again, being the technician in the business, I rolled my eyes and I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll just call it Adam Huber's detailing. And then just it just kind of rolled from there, okay? So it, it didn't have anything to do with ego. It was more... Um, Oh, okay. All right. I got you, Chris. All right. Since this is going to be, Chris, since this is part of a, you know, this is an actual podcast, people are going to be listening to this. I'm, I'm going to try and just kind of keep on track. But, dude, you know, you know, I respect you. I want you to keep commenting on this kind of stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, now, in this book, just so you guys know, I, I'm going to start we've gotten to the part of the book where we're going to be starting talking to Sarah. Sarah runs a pie baking business. Sarah is a technician. And so now we've kind of introduced her. We've gone through Sarah's story, which is very, very similar to most detailers out there. And if you pick up this book and you start reading it, you should be thinking to yourself, holy crap, this is literally me. Okay. Sarah replies back to, I don't remember what the guy's name is, but I guess I still don't get it, she said. What's wrong with being a technician? I used, to lo- I used to love the work that I do. And if I didn't have to do all these other things, I would still love it. There's nothing wrong with being a technician. There's only something wrong with being a technician who also owns a business. Pausing for effect. Because you need to think about that for a little bit. There's multiple different things in your, there's multiple things that make a business work well. A technician is a very small part of it. You need to know how to do the thing that you are selling or doing better than anyone else in your industry or in your area or strive to be the best. But it's just a very small part of it. You have to work at the other things or find people that do these other things equally as well as you do the work. Okay. Now, this is a very interesting part of this book. Very interesting. Now we're in the adolescence phase. Adolescence begins at the point in the life of your business when you decide to get some help. There's no telling how soon this will happen. Edgar, you just commented on this. There's no telling how soon this will happen, but it always happens. Precipitated by a crisis in the infancy stage. Every business that lasts must grow into the adolescent phase. Phase. Every small business owner who survives seeks help. What kind of help do you, the overloaded technician, go out to get? The answer is as easy as it is inevitable. Technical help. Most detailers that I know don't love to sit down and figure out the spreadsheets and figure out what what needs to be paid and what doesn't need to be paid. I am 100% this person. My wife, as much as I love her, tries to sit down and spreadsheet out like our finances and everything like that. And there's been multiple times that I've looked her in the eye and I've said, listen, are we going to have to sell the house? Okay, we're fine. I don't, we're good. Now, I've been trying to be better about that. I've been trying to get a little bit more in tune with where we need to be uh, as a household or whatever. But in my business, she's the one that took care of all the finances. Well, most of them. I made a lot of the calls in how we needed to grow and stuff like that. And then we worked together to figure out what we needed to do to get there. But uh, Edgar has pointed out that one of the best things that he ever did was hire a receptionist. It's hard to answer calls with the generator pressure washer running in the background. It's absolutely correct. Answering phone calls, answering messages and everything like that is a very important part of your business. But is it the part that is, that's what's making your business the most money? Now, I actually decided to do the reverse of Edgar. I decided that I could train people to detail very, very well. But I couldn't train someone how to answer the intricate questions that some some customers asked when it came to detailing. So I decided to be the receptionist and answer messages and do all the other things in the business while 
my employees were the ones doing the detailing. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that's what I personally decided to do because it was easier for me to train someone how to do uh, the detailing. Every adolescent business reaches a point where it pushes beyond its owner's comfort zone. The boundary within which he feels secure in his ability to control his environment and outside of which he begins to lose that control. The technician's boundary is determined by how much he can do himself. The manager's is defined by how many technicians he can supervise effectively or how many subordinate managers he can organize into a productive effort. The entrepreneur's boundary is a function of how many managers he can engage in pursuit of his vision. As a business grows, it invariably exceeds its owner's ability control, to control it, to touch, feel, and see the work that needs to be done, and to inspect its progress personally as every technician needs to do. I have a little note written here that I have been referring a lot to in the last um, couple of days. I need to mark this page right here because I'm going to need both my hands. As you guys have probably noticed, I talk with my hands a lot. There comes a point when your business grows to a point where you exceed your comfort zone. And I, I don't know if I like the, the phrase comfort zone because a lot of you guys are probably thinking right now, well, I mean, I'm outside of my comfort zone every day. I'm out there hustle, grinding, hashtag, entrepreneur hashtags, right? I'm always outside my comfort zone. That's, that's not exactly what they're talking about here. They're actually talking about that your business gets to a point where you where it actually outpaces your skill set as a human being. Every human being has a particular skill set that you will just reach the limit of, okay? What I what I and you can work your butt off to try and attain those skills, but you very rarely can the founder of a business get to the point where it can also operate a multi-million dollar business. You just don't have the skill set. For example, I'm 5'9", and I could practice basketball four hours a day if I wanted to. I'm not going to end up in the NBA. It's just not going to happen. I don't have that particular skill set. And the, the thing that I've been referring to quite often in the last probably week or two weeks, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of people about this, is that one of the things that I remember the most that applies to this is there was a business in town called Click Rain, and it was run by someone that I've had the great opportunity to sit down with and talk with uh, a couple of different times, and his name is Paul Tenhacken. He is now the mayor of Sioux Falls. A year and a half ago, um, someone from Sioux Falls remind me of this, but about a year and a half ago, Paul made the announcement that he was moving on from Click Rain and he sold it or gave it to, I don't know exactly how it worked, but he he moved on from being the founder slash CEO of it. And there was something that he wrote or it was something that he said that just stuck with me when I when he wrote it or said it. And he basically said that in every business's point, if you get lucky enough to build it to the point where it is now ha it has now exceeded your skill level as a human being that it is now your responsibility and your and your responsibility to your employees to hand it off to someone who has the skill set to be able to operate that business to the next level in which case they they will hit their skill level and then need to hand it off to someone else there's no shame in that he fired himself thanks dad there's no shame in that there's actually more shame in trying to run a business that has exceeded your skill set and letting down the people around you, in my opinion. And I would really love to know Paul's take on this. In fact, I may or may not write a letter or an email to Paul and ask him if we can sit down and do a podcast because I would dearly, dearly, dearly love to get to talk more in depth with him on this because he is a phenomenal person. But now I'm going to be honest with you guys. A lot of you guys running detailing businesses. Sorry to say, but I mean, if we just go back to the percentages, 80% of you aren't even going to last five years. 80% of you are not even going to last five years. The next five years after that, the 80% of that 80% aren't going to last till 10 years. So 
in order for you to get to that point would take massive amount of growth year over year. And just it, it most of you just aren't going to get there. But if you do happen to get there, if you amazingly are listening to this podcast and you and you feel like you're losing control in your business, you might want to sit down and have an honest conversation with yourself and say, do I have the skill set to be able to take this to operate this business where it's at now and to be able to take it to the next level? Need to have that conversation because nobody is going to nobody is gonna be able going to tell you that because you'll just huh, what do you know? I could do this. All right. Now we're going to go into the maturity and entrepreneurial perspective. This is where we start to okay, Adam. You've harped on us enough about how most people aren't going to be able to last and all this other stuff. Wh what do we do different then? Wh what's what's the big change? The person who launches his business as a mature company must also go through infancy and adolescence. He simply goes through them in an entirely different way. It's his perspective that makes the difference, his entrepreneurial perspective. And then we go into a really great story about what the entrepreneurial perspective is from um, Tom Watson, who uh, I don't know if he, yeah, he started IBM, but he started it in a very specific and different way. And if I remember correctly, Tom Watson started multiple different businesses. I'm going to skip through some of this. The third reason IBM has been so successful was that I, what, sorry, was that once I had a picture of how IBM would look when the dream was in place and how such, such a company would have to act, I then realized that unless we began to act that way from the very beginning, we would never get there. In other words, I realized that for IBM to become a great company, it would have to act like a great company long before it ever became one. Remember at the beginning of this podcast where I said that you have to go through business first in order to probably really understand this book. You would have to start and fail at a business before you actually fully grasp it. And I, I still maintain that. I, I, I feel like there's very few people, maybe one out of a thousand, one out of 10,000 that could, would be able to start a business with that perspective in mind. And those one in 10,000 or those one in 1,000, one in 10,000, those are the people that we look up to in the business world community as basically just gods. Like they just, they just got it right from the get go. I really, truly think that most of you guys are going to have to start a business, fail at it, and then be able to look back with someone who has more experience than you and say, how could that have gone better? What could we have done differently? And right here, Tom Watson says it. I don't know if you guys know IBM, probably one of the most well-known computer brands in the entire world ever, besides Microsoft and Apple. But IBM had their fingers in everything at one point in time, maybe not so much anymore. But he started the business knowing what it was going to look like and knowing how it was going to act from the get-go and worked towards that. It's very different than starting a business and then just kind of jabbing and like juking and dodging as you're going along. It's a, it's a different mindset. And I just don't know if you can do that without having started a business prior. This, this I thought was a very interesting thing because I see this in the, I see this in the detailing groups actually quite a bit. And maybe Chris, he might be able to relate to this too in the D in the DJ industry. This is going to sound really familiar to some of you guys. To the technician, the customer is always a problem because the customer never seems to want what the technician has to offer at the price at which he offers it. To the entrepreneur, however, the customer is always an opportunity because the, op the entrepreneur knows that within the customer is a continuing parade of changing wants begging to be satisfied. All the entrepreneur has to do is find out what those wants are and what they will be in the future. As a result, the world is a continuing surprise, a treasure hunt to the entrepreneur. To the technician, however, the world is a place that never seems to let him do what he wants to do. It rarely applauds his efforts. 
It rarely appreciates his work. It rarely, if ever, appreciates him. To the technician, the world always wants something he doesn't know how to give. In the detailing groups, there are detailers that say, gosh, these customers just don't get it. I just, why doesn't everyone want ceramic coatings? Why? Everyone should want ceramic coatings. It's obvious. They should pay me $2,000 a job in order for those, for me to be doing coatings every day. To which, if I actually get the chance to talk to them on the phone, I say, well, have you by chance told them what the value in having a coating is? Well, no, they should just get it. Eh, no, they shouldn't. It's your job as a business owner to explain the benefits of such things. Now, now if we take that specific instance, ceramic coatings, and we use the entrepreneur and the technician at the same time, we split it 50-50, to the technician in you, he's going to offer that coating and he's going to try and convince that customer to get the ceramic coating. To the entrepreneur in you, if that customer does not get the ceramic coating, how do you get them onto the wash clay wax? How do you just get their business in the first place? How do you get the, how do you get your foot in the door? I, uh, I've started rewatching a movie that there's a couple of movies that I really love to watch that to me speak really well to the entrepreneurial journey and what happens in business. Uh, one of them is, um, I can't remember, um, I can't remember, um, oh, sorry, Will Smith's Pursuit of Happiness. That is one of the greatest movies that I can think of off the top of my head that is pretty much the shining example in entrepreneurial struggle. If if you guys own a business and, uh, you know, you're in year two, three, whatever, and you watch that movie, you might cry at the end of it because it resonates so hard with you. The other movie that I've just recently started watching again, just because it's perspective thing was, uh, jobs or job. It's, it's about Steve jobs. And it's so funny because just, I only watch like probably 30, 45 minutes of it at a time. But last night before I was going to bed, I watched just a real quick clip of it. And it's kind of in the beginning part of the movie where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak are selling the Apple One, the very first prototype to um, a computer parts store. And what they did was they sold just the board. They tried selling just the board to the computer store. And the computer owner goes, well, I paid for an entire computer, not just the board. And Steve goes, livid just the board he says this is the cutting edge of technology do how dare you say that it's just a board what who cares about the case the keyboard and the computer that's the technician that right there is probably one of the best examples of the technician in the early days of apple i i don't know the entire history of apple so forgive me if i'm a little bit off in this but in the history of apple steve was the technician, uh, sorry, uh, Wozniak was the technician. Jobs was the entrepreneur. Jobs was the person that was just always pushing the boundaries and always dreaming bigger. And Wozniak was the guy who was, was making it happen. Um, so just very interesting movie. All right. Moving on. Man, I can't believe we've already done 52 minutes in this. Now, oh, let's see here. I'm on the wrong page. Oh, I did not mark down this part. My apologies. All right. So, what are we talking about? As far as the, what we were talking about last time, wh what do we have to do in order to get to that point? Pretend that the business you own or want to own is the prototype or will be the prototype for 5,000 more just like it. That your business is going to serve well 
serve as the model for 5,000 more just like it. Not almost like it, but just like it. Perfect replicates. Clones. In other words, pretend that you are going to franchise your business. I said pretend. I'm not saying that you should. That isn't the point here. Unless, of course, you want it to be. Further, now that you know what the game is, the franchise game, understand that there are rules to follow if you are to win. So we're getting kind of towards the end of where I've bookmarked some stuff. The rest of the book is basically trying to get you to be thinking about if you were to franchise your business from the get-go, what would you have to do? You would have to create standard operating procedures for every aspect of your business. Every single aspect of the business. In McDonald's, there is a standard operating procedure as to how to do those fries. You put the fries in the fryer at a certain temperature. You only fry them for a certain period of time. You leave them out of the fryer for a certain period of time before you ever put them in the actual container to give to the customer. Now, do those things get followed all the time? Of course not. We've always we've got, we've all gone to McDonald's where, you know, some fries taste a little bit different than other fries. They're a little bit oversalted compared to other ones. But the point of it here is that if you're the technician in your business and you're the person that's just like, I'm going to grind and hustle to make this successful. And then if you were to ever try and replicate it, well, what are you going to do? Split your time between two different shops and be just as successful? No, that is madness. That, that would never happen. But if you create a standard operating procedure, now you're initially going to have to put in quite a bit of work in order to make that second location work. You know, there's kind of a steep curve in what's going to work. But afterwards, it can just kind of run on autopilot. You know, you still got to jump in every once in a while just to tune things up, make sure things are going along well, slap some people upside the head, say, what are you thinking here? The fries are supposed to be in there for three minutes, not two minutes and 45 seconds. Keep them in there for three minutes. Because people are going to slip. They're going to they're gonna do things that they think is the better way to go about it. But they didn't build McDonald's. The fry boy did not build McDonald's. There, I'm going to go over these five different points of, oh man, these are so good. So how are you going to build your business? There are basically five tenets to it, and it goes into an explanation of each one of these tenets. If you want to read these tenets, you're going to have to buy the book yourself, which every single person that's listening to this or watching this, by the way, thank you for watching this, you should be buying this book. One, the model will provide consistent value to your customers, employees, suppliers, and lenders beyond what they expect. What does that mean? That means that when you visit a McDonald's in one place, it should be the exact ex exact experience in another place and an exact experience in another place and an exact experience in another place. doesn't matter if you're on a different continent or just in a different county. You, the experience should be the exact same replicated over and over again. Two, now this one for you detailers, listen to this. The model will be operated by people with the lowest possible level of skill. The lowest possible level of skill. There are some detailing businesses that are, that are out there that are very successful because they have hired the top talent in their area. But more often than not, that the, you cannot keep that top talent around because of whatever reason. They're a prima donna. They feel like, basically they feel like they can start this whole process over again. I'm working somewhere. I'm the best at it. Hell, I'll go run my own business. Whatever. You, you're going to run into that kind of issue if you hire the top talent more often than not. Now, if you can build a business to where the lowest possible skilled person can come in and do an effective job at your business, now you've got something. Now you've got something that can be replicated. Doesn't matter where it's at because... You're not searching for the highest grade people. You're searching for people that can just, they're just basically warm bodies filling a spot. All right, we're going to move on to point number three. Oh, actually, I've got a point on point number two. It is literally impossible to produce a consistent result in a business that depends on extraordinary people. No business can do it for long and no extraordinary business tries to. Because every extraordinary business knows that when you intentionally build your business around the skills of ordinary people, 
you'll be forced to ask the difficult questions about how to produce a result without the extraordinary ones. I don't know. Some guy smarter than me wrote this book and that's what he says. The model will stand out as a place of impeccable order. If you have a detailing shop and you have a customer come back into the detailing shop, do you think the detailing shop should be dirty? Think about that. Oh, I'm going to be bringing my uh, car in and they roll it into the garage. This floor hasn't been swept in four weeks, hasn't been mopped, the walls are dirty, there's compound dust everywhere, there's wool hanging in the air. Doesn't give a lot of confidence. In fact, I think in one of the podcasts I talked about, I think it was in the last podcast, I talked about my pickup. That had rust holes in everywhere that, you know, just didn't look professional. Hard to sell $2,000 coatings when you don't look like a $2,000 service. All work in the model will be documented in operations manuals. Standard operating procedures, just like I said. Um, the model will provide a uniformly predictable service to the customer. Uh, my Facebook Live here stopped. Whoops. The model will provide a uniformly predictable service to the customer. Um, just like I said before, you're going to get the same service anywhere. It doesn't matter where you're at. I'm going to fast forward here. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of my points in this book. Again, guys, if you want to know more about this book, you need to buy it. That was only about half of the book, literally just about half of it. If you want to know more and if you want to start executing on this and if you want to build a business that's better, then pick up that book and execute on it. Now, we're going to go into the last part of this podcast, which is paying the fee. And then I have to go to a meeting. Honestly, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're listening to the podcast and you didn't get value out of this episode, go ahead and unsubscribe from the podcast. Don't listen to it anymore because you're just blatantly, you're, you just, you're never going to learn something then. I will just go ahead. I'll just come right out and say it. If you didn't get value from this episode on, on this podcast, if you weren't thinking to yourself, holy crap, that is me over and over again, you're, you're, that, you're not teachable. And thus, I don't know if I really want you listening to the podcast. Because I want people listening to this podcast that are going to go out and execute on things that are on this podcast. And that right there is a whole lot of executable advice. So, if you got value out of this podcast episode, which I know you did, share the podcast episode. This this particular episode should be literally lit up in the detailing groups. It should never be ending. Um, oh, it looks like the... Facebook live stream still going. My bad. <laughs> I mean, you guys are just kidding yourselves if you don't think that this is almost every detailer that we act or interact with on a daily basis. You're just kidding yourself. Share the podcast episode if it brought you value, which I know it did. Um, send it to a friend and say, you need to listen to this because this is you. And I don't care if it's just in the detailing business. It can be pie baking shops it can be cbd oils I don't, it doesn't matter someone needs to listen to this episode and someone needs to listen to it because they need to pick up this book not because they need to watch me or they need to listen to my salt um soothing sultry voice okay that's not the point the whole point of this podcast is to try and get as many people the help that they need and this book is one of the very first is one of the things that people need help on Share the podcast episode. Pay the fee. That is the fee for you guys that are new. The fee is if, if the podcast episode has brought you value to share it. Share the episode. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of the Optimum Synergy Podcast. We look forward to seeing you next week. Hope you enjoyed the ride.